911, what's the nature of your emergency? She was already bad, not need him. She was four over the 28 from one truck when you're ready. She's in line truck, boy, Lincoln X ray 985, should come back up next. Grand Rapids, Michigan, March 13, 2019. Dispatch received a call just before 10.30 a.m. where the caller could barely be heard as she whispered, I need help. As the call taker verified the caller's address and tried to ask what was going on, the caller urged the operator to please hurry and send the police. The operator still struggled to understand the female as she whispered some more, and then the call disconnected. Wednesday, March 13, 2019. 10, 20, 9, and 25 seconds. Nine one one emergency. Hello? Okay, where are you located? I'm sorry, ma'am, I can't hear you. Are you able to tell me where you're located? No. Are you at a... Bye, bye, with the Sheldon Avenue Southeast. Please hurry now. Okay, I got Sheldon. What's the number? 553 five, Sheldon. Okay, can you tell me what's going on there? Okay, ma'am, I'll start the police that way. Can you tell me what your name is? Yeah. Who's the person who's causing trouble there? Okay, I've got a call entered, so we're going to get the police started that way, all right? Can you tell me what room of the house you're in? The caller was Kiana Griffin, a bubbly and outgoing 25-year-old who lived in the home with her grandmother, Jacqueline Baber Bay, her aunt, Charletta Baber Bay, and the aunt's boyfriend, Darrell Brown, who everyone knew as Jay. It's unknown exactly what the call taker heard in that minute and a half call, and then what was passed along from the call taker to the dispatcher, and then to the deputies on the road, but due to radio transmission recordings, we do know for sure the transmission included that there was a female whispering on the line someone was trying to quote-unquote assault her. Suspicious condition. We have a female whispering on the line that somebody's trying to assault her. Seven minutes and 41 seconds after Kiana's call disconnected, Three police officers arrived at 553 Sheldon Southeast and began checking the premises. They walked to the front door and began knocking. One officer was seen knocking three separate times over the span of about a minute, but no one answered the door. The officer then asked dispatch to try to get the caller back on the line. However, after attempting, dispatch advised they were negative contact with the caller. The three officers then began walking around the outside of the home and peering into windows to try to catch a glimpse of anything or anyone inside.
Vincent, you can try to call back. Side door. Ten four. Why get any answer in the front door? Oh, that look. I think it looks big. It is. Eighteen ten. Can you run license plate? Seems like it's empty. Uh, you can see it. it looks like a little dining room or something there. It's empty. Just it goes around. There's nothing in the back here. Call looked interesting. I'm trying to kill her.
Uh, you can see it. It looks like a little dining room or something in there. It's empty. put in for that background so spot. I. Just two people. Yep. Who was the other person? Katie. I thought I saw it. That's a very happy looking dog. Go make friends with it. It is. This just goes around. There's nothing on the back here. Looks like there's a fence on the other side, but. Everything seemed fine. No sounds of distress could be heard. There was no blood or signs of anything else suspicious. And with all the doors locked, the officers legally could not force entry into the home. The officers then left, however, unbeknownst to them, they would be called back to the same residence two hours and 18 minutes later, and this time, they would find out the events that had occurred after that minute and a half phone call and what had been lying behind the doors of 553 Sheldon Avenue. Nine one one emergency. From the five fifty three seven, my sister not moving. What's the address? Five fifty three seven. There's blood everywhere. My sister's not moving. Okay, stand on. You said shirt. 
553 Sheldon Avenue Southeast, so correct? Yes, please. Please, sir, she's not breathing. I don't know. I don't see not moving. I'm holding her head, please. Okay. All righty. Stand the line with me. I do have fire and police on the way. Stand the line with me. We're going to connect over to medical, okay? And you said that there's blood everywhere? There's blood everywhere. Okay. Did she cut herself or try to commit suicide? I don't know. She's doing a job. She's doing a job. She's doing a job. She's doing a job. Grand Rapids here. I pre-alerted already for 553 Sheldon Avenue Southeast. 553 Sheldon yes. Southeast? Yes. Pre-alert already for a female there not breathing. Caller says she sees a lot of blood. All right. Caller? Oh, Ma'am? Oh, my Lord. Ma'am, I have help on the way. I have a few questions. Tell me. Is she exactly back here? Come on, is she back here? Oh my God. Ma'am, I need to know what's going on there. Tell me what's going on. I'm not a man with her brother. I don't know. She's naked. I need to stop over here before I go to work. So my granny house and her friends was over here outside. We came in, and I, I didn't even come upstairs. Her friend did, and she here naked, blood everywhere. Please. Okay. Kiana! All right. Kiana. How, old, how old is she? She's 20. She born in 94. Okay. She's 94. She's about 29. All right. I need she to ask. Ma'am, they're on the way. I need to ask you, is oh, she breathing? Ma'am, is she breathing? I'm not a ma'am. No, I'm a her brother. Okay. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Please come out. They're on their oh way there. No Med one. Med one is not the one on. Okay. Well, you can stay on. I'm sorry. What was oh that? My God. Stay on. Okay. Where is she bleeding from? I don't know. Is this somebody stabbed her? Right here. Yeah, somebody stabbed her. Something. She's been stabbed. Yes, it's okay. blood everywhere. My little sister is naked. Please come on. Okay, sir, they're on the way, okay? All right. Is she breathing? No, I don't know. I don't know how to tell. She's not moving. I'm yelling her name. She's not moving. Okay. Please. All right, they're on the way there. I need you to tell me now every time she takes a breath in. I need to know if she's breathing. Oh, no, she's not moving. It's like she's, she's not breathing. everywhere. Like she's just breathing for a long time. Okay. All right, we're going to stage on this one as well. Okay. Kiana's brother, Sanford Cummings II, had called 911, alerting police that he had found his sister on the floor of an upstairs bedroom, covered in blood and not moving. Seven minutes later, when police arrived, they were greeted with a shocking scene. Kiana was the first to be found. She had been shot four times, including once in the face. As they continued, they then found Kiana's Aunt Charletta, who had been shot in the back of her head. She appeared to have been lying on her stomach on the bed, watching an iPad that had been propped up on a pillow beside her. She had earbuds still in her ears, and the iPad still playing videos. After police were notified that Kiana's grandmother, Jacqueline Baber Bay, had also lived in the home, but that she had left at 8 o'clock that morning to go to work, that left one other person unaccounted for. It didn't take long for police to put the pieces together as they quickly named Charlotta's boyfriend, Darrell Brown, as a strong person of interest. A high point firearm was found discarded in an alley behind the home, along with a box of ammunition, which would later match casings found at the crime scene. When the gun was ran through the National Crime Database, it came back registered to a female who had actually reported the gun stolen two years earlier, back in 2017. The female turned out to be an ex-girlfriend to none other than Darrell Brown. Police searched high and low for Darrell, but by the time the murders were discovered, he had already been long gone.
Shortly after the incident, he was seen on surveillance footage about a mile north of the crime scene, and then again on CCTV at the Children's Museum. It's unclear exactly why he had stopped there, but the employee at the front desk said Durrell had asked to be let in because he knew someone inside. However, he was told he was not allowed to go in. He was seen exiting the museum 12 minutes later, then would be seen one more time on surveillance footage in another part of the city. After that, Durrell was never seen again. To this day, police are still looking for Durrell, who they've since changed from a person of interest to a suspect. In July of 2021, he was added to the U.S. Marshals' 15 Most Wanted list, and there's an up to $25,000 reward for any information on where he may be. Police say he pretty much lived off the grid prior to the murders. He didn't have a job, no Facebook, no cell phone, so it's been difficult to find any trace of him. It was concluded he didn't even have that much money, so officials believe he has to be getting help from someone. He has relatives in Ohio, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia, all places that police have continued to look over the past few years with no luck. Bruce Norton, acting U.S. Marshal of the District of Western Michigan, thinks he's likely living in plain sight, saying, quote, He looks very unassuming and could literally be standing behind you in a grocery checkout lane, end quote. Kiana's family said they didn't actually know much about Darrell. Charletta's mother said she was sweet, trusting, quiet, and shy, and that Darrell was actually her first real boyfriend, but he and Kiana didn't have the best relationship. Despite this, he had been living in the home with Charletta and her family for two years. The family said there were never any signs of violence between the two or anything that would lead anyone to believe he would do something like this. However, court records showed that Durrell had a violent past with women. Court records document Brown's explosive violence toward women. In 2005, another woman, the mother of one of Brown's children, told police he thought she had gotten smart with him, so he tied her up with cords, kicked her in the face, gagged her, urinated on her, and doused her with lighter fluid. She escaped, and later one of the charges dropped because she said she still loved him, knew he needed help, and did not think he would get it in prison. Brown ultimately pleaded guilty to misdemeanor domestic violence. The family was understandably frustrated that deputies didn't break down the door after that initial call, resulting in Darrell having a two-and-a-half-hour head start instead of what could have been an eight-minute head start. Being that I work as a 911 dispatcher, I do understand the patrol deputies go to multiple calls all day throughout their shift, and they take each call seriously, but several of those calls end up being cleared as unfounded or that the subjects were gone on arrival, etc., and nothing ever comes of it. Sadly, that wasn't the case for this call. The Grand Rapid Police defended their actions, saying due to the Fourth Amendment, they unfortunately could only force entry into the home where there were obvious exigent circumstances, and it would need to be something more than a phone call. Grand Rapids Police Sergeant John Witkowski said the officers had no way of knowing what was behind those doors and that they can't go around kicking everyone's doors down because of a phone call. But looking back, I'm sure those deputies do wish they had made other choices that day. Maybe things would have turned out differently. Maybe Durrell would have been caught in time before he fled. But unfortunately, we'll never know. Tragically, this wasn't the end of the heartbreak that this family would endure. In July of 2020, the fire department was called to 553 Sheldon Avenue, where they came upon the residents engulfed in flames. Once the fire was put out, Grandma Jacqueline Baber Bay and her five-year-old grandson, Amarion Cummings, were found in a back bathroom. It appeared they had tried to escape the flames, but they had succumbed to smoke inhalation. In the cause of the fire, investigators determined it was accidental, started by a burning candle that had been lit the night before during a vigil for Kiana and Charletta. Today, the family is still hurt by the events and still frustrated that Darrell has not been caught, but police say they're doing everything they can to capture him. Darrell is 48 years old. He's 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighs about 180 pounds. 
He's black and has black hair and brown eyes. He has used the aliases J.J. Robinson, Michael Richardson, and Marcus Wright. Anyone with information is asked to contact the nearest U.S. Marshal's office. You can contact the U.S. Marshal's Service Communications Center at 1-877-WANTED-2 or online at www.usmarshals.gov tips.